Hello, everyone, and welcome to this uh, first of uh, four uh, webinars on uh, climate accounting. We've really been uh, looking forward to this. Um, good to see so many uh, attendees uh, online. I have a bit of uh, practical information um, uh, before we get started. Uh, I have to say that this webinar will be recorded and made, made available on demand on the IWA Connect Plus platform for presentation slides and other information. Uh, the speakers are responsible for securing copyright permissions for any work that they will present, of which they are not the legal copyright holder. The opinions, hypotheses, conclusions and recommendations contained in the presentations and other materials are the sole responsibility of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect IWA opinion. Um, there will be some possibilities to, to ask questions um, along the, the webinar. Um, you have to use the uh, chat box. Uh, you can see that in, in the bottom of the screen. Uh, you can use this for general requests and for interactive activities. And you can use the Q&A box for uh, questions to the panelists. Um, and these questions uh, will be answered during the discussions and uh, or in the post-webinar materials. Um, you are all, uh, all attendees are muted uh, and you cannot uh, use the raised hand uh, function. Uh, only use this uh, chat box and Q&A box uh, possibilities. Thank you. Um, good. I want to say a little bit of uh, the, the, the background of why we're here. Um, this is a very uh, interesting topic, of course. Uh, um, and we, uh, a lot of you people listening today might also uh, have been, been present at the uh, IWA conference in Copenhagen uh, last year. That was a very interesting uh, workshop, first of all, uh, which was uh, initiated by the uh, the four water and wastewater associations uh, in in the Nordic countries, in Denmark and Sweden, Norway and Finland. And we had some very uh, interesting um, inputs from, with examples from utilities around the world. Uh, and also we had some very good uh, roundtable discussions. And it became very clear that we needed to to uh, have these discussions out in a, in a broader format. And there was a lot more to be uh, discussed. Also at the same conference, um, a, uh, a report uh, called the Nordic Report was launched, and this um, Miriam Feilberg from from Denver will uh, will present uh, later in this webinar. Um, we got together after this, uh, especially this workshop at the IWA conference. Um, uh, I talked a lot with uh, Amanda Lake about how we could uh, how we could go on with this. Um, and Amanda took uh, contact with the uh, IWA, Climate Smart Utilities uh, Network, and we, uh, we started to, to try and organize these webinars. So it's uh, Brenda and Charles from IWA, Amanda Lake from Jacobs, and anna Katrine Vangsgaard and myself from, uh, from Invidane, who has been organize, uh, organizing this, um, this first webinar and will also be organizing the next uh, three webinars. Um, I'd like to say a little bit about the, um, the background also from a Danish perspective. Um, now, the, the whole uh, webinar series are based on the Nordic experience um, and uh, a, a lot of other countries in the in EU and other, uh, also other countries are looking towards the Nordics and especially towards Denmark because uh, a lot of things are happening uh, here. Um, first of all, there's an overall target in Denmark. Um, that the entire sector want to be energy and climate neutral by 2030. There's been a lot of success in the co cooperation between legislators, uh, technology providers, consultants, etc., cetera, um, to try to, to uh, get more knowledge, to measure, and try to get these measurements into actual um, legislation. Um, and Two examples I've shown here, it's in Danish, so uh, you might not be able to see the, the, the text on the report, but it's a big study on uh, nitrous oxide um, funded by the Danish EPA. 
Um, in this report, uh, nine wastewater treatment plants were studied quite uh, intensively. Um, and this was the basis of a new Danish emission factor for nitrous oxide. Uh, you might have seen the number, 0.84% uh, nitrous uh, oxide emissions um, per um, TN in the inlet. Um, another big study was uh, funded by the uh, Danish uh, EA Energy Agency. Um, and here we saw that uh, an, an average loss of methane from almost half of the wastewater treatment plants in Denmark showed 7.7% uh, loss of methane. So it really opened the eyes also of the legislators that something had to be done in terms of methane, but also nitrous oxide emissions. So what's going on now in terms of legislation in Denmark is that um, it has been, been stated that a nitrous oxide emission uh, limit will be implemented implemented no later than 2025 for all wastewater treatment plants bigger than 30,000 PE. And also uh, it has already been um, taken into uh, account now that, that all uh, wastewater treatment plants with biogas production needs to have an internal protocol and also an annual check by a third party. Um, and then they're also working on some more specific uh, limits for, 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 for methane. So a lot of things are happening in this uh, in the water sector in Denmark. So what we want to uh, go through today uh, is this quick background. Then we'll move into a, a broad look into the uh, greenhouse gas emissions with an EU perspective by Alberto Pistocci uh, and Vanessa Paravicini. Then we'll move on to uh, and zoom in on the Nordic uh, the Nordic report um, by Miriam Falder from uh, Denmark. And then we'll have a case um, by Natalia from Bergenbank. Uh, and then we'll have some time for discussion, question and answers in between, and also in the end of the uh, webinar. Um, three more webinars are coming. The first one will be uh, zooming in on uh, methane emissions. And this will be monitor or, uh, moderated by Amanda Lake. Um, the next one will be zooming in on nitrous oxide. This one will be moderated by Anna Katrina. Uh, and the third one uh, will zoom out a little bit more and look into a broader perspective, not only CO2, but also look into to, uh, yeah, planetary boundaries, life cycle assessment and, and stuff like that. So put these dates in your calendar now and um, we will uh, we'll make sure to, to post it uh, later. So today um, we have myself, I'm a... a Head of R&D within sustainability at uh, the Scandinavian consultant uh, company uh, called Invidane. After me, Alberto Pistocchi will, uh, will take over. Uh, Alberto is an environmental engineer and land planner and also a scientific project officer at the European Commission Joint Research Centre. Um, then Miriam Feilberg will talk about the Scandinavian, um, the, the Nordic report. Um, Miriam is a head of climate at the Danish Water and Wastewater Association of Denmark, and has a lot of experience within uh, climate change adaptation and, and planning. And in the, in the end, Natalia will take over. Um, Natalia is a senior engineer in Back and Ben, um, and she's very experienced within especially the fields of uh, energy and uh, climate. Good, I will give the word to Alberto. Thank you, Jacob. Uh, uh, thank you, Jacob. Uh, good morning, everyone. Good afternoon. Sorry. Um, I'm going to present uh, uh, the results of a study that we conducted as the scientific service of the European Commission in support of the um, uh, revision of the Urban Wastewater Directive that you may be familiar with, uh, particularly for what concerns the uh, balance of emissions of greenhouse gases from the wastewater treatment system, including uh, everything that goes from uh, uh, the um, collection of uh, um, uh, wastewater uh, to the different forms of treatment and disposal of the effluents. Uh, the study was uh, uh, led by Vanessa Arravicini, who is uh, also here, and um, I'm uh, presenting uh, the key messages mainly from a, an aggregated point of view. We are happy, of course, to address uh, more specific and detailed questions later on. Uh, as uh, will become uh, 
uh, of interest uh, for the audience. Um, um, there is, uh, as you know very well, a European Green Deal that was launched in uh, 2019, uh, a context in which the European Union has adopted ambitious goals for the reduction of greenhouse gas emissions, uh, along with pollution reduction and circular economy. Uh, wastewater treatment is clearly at the center of these uh, uh, three dimensions of the Green Deal. Wastewater collection and treatment is a contributor to the overall greenhouse gas emissions of the European Union uh, to a non-negligible extent and is reported uh, as such under the uh, UN Convention. Uh, so, uh, presently, there is already some reporting of uh, emissions from wastewater uh, treatment systems. Uh, however, for the goals, uh, for, for the in support to the revision of the Urban Wastewater Treatment Directive, we, want to we wanted to have a, a closer and more operational look at what uh, uh, contributes to the uh, emissions of uh, the wastewater sector. And uh, uh, to this end, we developed a calculation that uh, encompasses uh, virtually all emissions that we expect uh, from the wastewater collection and treatment system at the European scale, uh, beyond what is reported to an extent in a conventional way under the existing uh, um, procedures. Uh, the ultimate goal was to, to explore the, the leeway that we have, uh, the possibilities and opportunities that we have uh, towards reducing the greenhouse gas emissions of uh, uh, wastewater and um, uh, explore how this may uh, uh, roll out uh, in different scenarios of policy. In the study uh, that we have performed, uh, we consider direct emissions that are the ones already addressed by the IPCC guidelines of 2006 and the um, update of 2019. Uh, the indirect emissions related to construction, operation, electricity and reagents, particularly uh, with uh, regard to uh, phosphorus removal. Um, and uh, eventually, uh, we estimated uh, on this basis uh, a burden, or uh, in some cases, a credit of uh, uh, carbon uh, dioxide uh, equivalent uh, emissions uh, for uh, typologies of plants uh, that uh, were uh, expected to represent the European system. Uh, in this table, you see some uh, uh, components uh, of emissions, direct and indirect emissions, that we consider. Uh, the typical credit is about uh, uh, credits from the production of renewable energy, uh, electricity or biomethane to an extent. Um, in operation, we consider uh, the emissions of N2 and uh, uh, CH4 uh, within the treatment process and with the effluents, as well as uh, uh, the methane that we expect to, uh, to be strict at the arrival of effluents at the wastewater treatment plants that somehow uh, combines also emissions uh, uh, associated with the collection system. Uh, this is a sketch of uh, uh, the system that we are describing. As you see, you have F influence uh, entering the treatment process, then the water and the sludge lines, and then an effluent uh, that emits uh, uh, to, to some extent uh, in the receiving water bodies. Uh, emissions include N2 emissions from the biological state, stage, uh, methane emission from sludge, from the sludge line, and uh, uh, nitrous oxide and uh, uh, methane in the effluents, according to the IPCC uh, guidelines of 2019. Um, uh, we uh, identified uh, a set of uh, typical plants, uh, and uh, then we, we classified uh, the about 25,000 uh, uh, wastewater treatment plants available in the urban wastewater treatment database of the European Union, of the European Environment Agency and the Commission. Um, uh, on the basis of the level of treatment and the size of the plant, we made assumptions on uh, uh, the type of treatment. Uh, the main uncertainty here is related to the fact that we don't know if uh, a plant without uh, uh, full-blown nitrogen removal anyway addresses to some extent uh, um, ammonia, so there is um, uh, an 
oxidation of uh, ammonia or not, depending on the cases. And so we, we considered both cases and uh, we took the range of uh, outcomes corresponding to the two typologies. In the case, a plant was known not to have uh, a nitrogen removal stage. For the rest, it's uh, rather straightforward to attribute a typology to a plant uh, on the basis of size and level of treatment. Uh, another assumption that we had to make was about uh, the type of sludge stabilization. Uh, we assumed uh, anaerobic digestion for plants uh, uh, above uh, 30,000 population equivalents, and for smaller plants, uh, uh, simultaneous aerobic sludge stabilization, whereas uh, um, in, uh, in many cases, uh, uh, for smaller plants, uh, we also assumed uh, uh, reed beds uh, or other systems of, uh, of treatment of the sludge. Um, uh, we did not include uh, emissions related to the transport and, dis and final disposal of the sludge because that can be very specific and was out of the scope of our analysis. Uh, whereas uh, uh, the operation of the plant and uh, uh, the emissions embedded in the infrastructure, in the construction of the infrastructure, were also included in the calculation. Um, um, uh, uh, the emission factor uh, of N2, uh, for uh, nitrous oxide uh, for the biological stage uh, was set uh, lower at plants targeting and removal of denitrification. Uh, that is a peculiarity of, uh, sorry, um, peculi uh, can I go back? No? Uh, how, how do I go back? Uh, I clicked uh, by mistake. Okay, um, sorry. Um, uh, this, this slide presents uh, the emission fact, let's say the, the emissions per uh, unit uh, uh, treated population, so per population equivalent, uh, in terms of uh, CO2 equivalents. Uh, for the different typologies of plants that we considered. Uh, the details can be found in, uh, in a paper that has been published that you can find linked uh, uh, in the slides and from which uh, all the, the figures are taken. But uh, uh, without going into details, you see that the gray part corresponds to uh, the emissions embedded in the infrastructure. Uh, the uh, bluish part corresponds to emissions related to methane. Uh, the green tones parts uh, correspond to emissions of, uh, emissions of N2O from the process and from the effluents, and uh, uh, the red part corresponds to the um, reagents for uh, phosphorus removal. Uh, whereas uh, um, the pink uh, parts of the bars are uh, emissions with electricity, assuming a certain carbon intensity of electricity, that of course is uh, a parameter of the assessment. Um, based on these uh, uh, emission factors, uh, uh, we uh, started exploring different uh, uh, scenarios of wastewater treatment across Europe. So, assuming that all plants of a certain typology uh, were undergoing a certain level of treatment. Uh, and uh, the results are summarized in this bar chart, uh, where you see the current situation where we emit approximately uh, 35 million tons of CO2 equivalent per year. Uh, of which uh, about 14 million are uh, associated with the uh, construction of the infrastructure. So they are somehow embedded, sunken in, uh, in the infrastructure. And then we started uh, uh, performing some what-if uh, uh, scenario calculation, seeing how far we could go in uh, reducing emissions with a number of, uh, um, uh, of uh, policy options, including uh, first of all, uh, uh, going towards full compliance with the existing uh, legislation, that does not change a lot, uh, but still we have parts of Europe where the treatment is less efficient than it should be. Um, uh, then we started uh, considering energy efficiency, so uh, reducing the electricity consumption of uh, the plants. Um, uh, then uh, uh, starting to decarbonize uh, completely uh, the electricity that we use in plants, uh, uh, mm, add uh, to the decarbonization of electricity also the possibility to upgrade uh, the um, biogas uh, to biomethane uh, 
uh, used uh, in, in the net, uh, so for uses outside of, uh, of the wastewater treatment plant, and so displacing fossil methane, uh, and that brings additional benefits. And then uh, other scenarios that you can see here, for instance, uh, a scenario where we perform very extensive uh, uh, nitrogen removal, denitrification with uh, um, um, uh, basically with a simultaneous uh, aerobic sludge stabilization at every plant, uh, which may not be regarded probably as a realistic scenario, but it's a limit scenario to, uh, to analyze the extent to which uh, we can reduce N2 emissions. And uh, uh, this gives you a range uh, of what we expect uh, uh, by adopting different measures uh, uh, as uh, blanket measures across the European Union. Uh, this uh, uh, gave us the possibility to explore uh, from the current uh, uh, scenario to the uh, maximum possible uh, reduction uh, of uh, emissions that we considered uh, in, in the different uh, assumptions, uh, country by country, by how much we could reduce emissions. Uh, uh, of CO2 equivalent uh, in Europe from the wastewater treatment sector. Um, uh, one aspect to mention that I would uh, um, drop here for general consideration is that uh, the revision of the Urban Wastewater Treatment Directive also uh, um, proposes uh, uh, the introduction of an advanced treatment for micropollutants. This advanced treatment may entail non-negligible CO2 equivalent emissions because of the energy and the materials that may be required. Uh, these emissions have been quantified at a very preliminary uh, level, but uh, uh, do not uh, uh, figure into the calculations that we have performed. There is a possibility to perform uh, uh, advanced treatment by completely offsetting uh, the emissions uh, uh, using uh, uh, let's say, uh, renewable uh, electricity and uh, renewable non-fossil materials uh, uh, for, the, for the advanced treatment. So this is a, a point of warning that we should be aware of in the development of the system. Uh, but uh, apart from uh, uh, this consideration, uh, the general pictures that we drew from, uh, uh, from this uh, simulation of scenarios uh, is that we have a quantification of uh, 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 European wastewater uh, uh, sector emissions uh, that uh, uh, may range uh, uh, from 50 to 125 uh, kilograms of CO2 equivalent uh, uh, per population equivalent uh, per year, uh, of which a significant share, uh, 20 to 40 kilograms, are embedded in the infrastructure. Uh, the main contributors to these amounts are N2O emissions, and uh, electricity in the operation, uh, then uh, direct uh, uh, CH4 emissions as a third, let's say, contributor to the overall emissions. Um, uh, this amounts to a current uh, level of uh, 35 uh, million tons, and uh, those uh, uh, emissions can be significantly reduced, but of course not uh, brought to zero, uh, by uh, primarily by efficient use of electricity, decarbonization, and uh, 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 so uh, for a large part, uh, uh, measures related to the energy neutrality of plants that is also requested under the proposed revision of the directive. Uh, one key aspect is uh, uh, ensuring an efficient denitrification and I'm sure the uh, approach, uh, for instance, exemplified by the Danish uh, um, uh, limits uh, to N2O that uh, we were uh, seeing before, could be a, a good opportunity to go in that direction uh, and uh, uh, step up with the uh, reduction of emissions. Many thanks. And, uh, Thank you, Alberto. Perfect timing. Thank you for that. Um, I would like to to start with a question. Well, first of all, I would like to, to thank you for a very good presentation and a very uh, substantial piece of work. Um, very interesting. Um, 
I would like to. I like that you had the the, uh, the slide on the uh, um, treatment, advanced treatment for micropollutants, because I mean this is just one of the, the things where we actually are getting um, bigger demand on on treatment of the wastewater, which will make it even more difficult to to become uh, climate neutral. And then we're talking about this climate neutrality. I would like to, you, for you to. Uh, to reflect a little bit on that, because when I saw your graph with the different uh, things you can do to get closer to this climate neutrality, that's a long way. Uh, could you um, could you say anything about that? I mean, how, I've, how, how are you looking at that? Uh, I think we have to be aware that uh, the technical possibility, the current technical possibilities are limited. Uh, we have uh, emissions that, as we see, uh, derive, uh, uh, okay, from the infrastructure, and the way forward is to limit uh, the, the emissions embedded in uh, concrete, steel, plastics, etc., that form part of the infrastructure. That's, of course, a very complex uh, debate, and it's probably out of, uh, of the scope of this uh, conversation. But uh, an implication for us is probably that we need to limit the extent of the infrastructure to the minimum possible. Uh, compatible with our environmental objectives and then offset what cannot be uh, reduced, basically. Then uh, if we go to the uh, emissions that theoretically could be uh, compressed, uh, it's apparent that uh, the lion's share is, uh, is uh, electricity, uh, methane and, uh, of course, nitrous oxide. So, whichever uh, innovation in, in process uh, design or uh, in the typologies of processes that may help uh, uh, avoid uh, leaks of uh, methane or N2O uh, is by far uh, needed and uh, will have to go that way anyway. Uh, for the present time, I think efficient denitrification and decarbonizing electricity are the, the ways to go and the, the control of fugitive uh, methane emissions, for instance, whatever can be fixed within reason uh, with the current technologies should be implemented as soon as possible. That was, also, that was one uh, yeah, question in the Q&A, uh, yeah, the same kind of question, how, how to become carbon neutral. I think we kind of cover, covered this, uh, this question. I must say that uh, when I presented in the beginning that this uh, in Denmark you have this uh, overall aim of being uh, carbon neutral. It's actually only in the operational phase. So I'm glad that your your work is also uh, uh, taking into account the uh, yeah the, the building uh, the building phase. Um, yeah. For instance, extending uh, sewer networks uh, uh, beyond uh, reason should be regarded with, uh, with particular attention because uh, uh, sewers embed significant emissions. So centralizing treatment implies, uh, in some cases, disproportionate emissions in the, in the infrastructure. If, uh, I mean, of course, if the infrastructure already exists, uh, the, the situation is very different, but uh, we have to think about that. Good. Thank you, Alberto. Um, we'll be moving on. We'll be looking into the, the Q&A uh, session um, later also, and we will, um, we will have some time at the very end of the session to, 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 take, uh, to take in some of the questions from you guys. But um, we will have to move on to, uh, to Miriam from Denmark. Miriam, please uh, take the floor. Thank you so much, uh, Jakob. Um, I think you hear me now. So we, we are all aware that we are facing really severe risks related to climate change. And we have also heard now, uh, and thank you very much for an interesting presentation, Alberto, that from the water sector, there is also significant impact related to climate change. From the Nordic water sector, it is a, a decision that we are willing uh, to take up this challenge and live up to our our commitments uh, in terms of uh, reducing CO2 emissions from our activities. But we also need to ask ourselves the, the questions, 
is climate and energy neutrality actually possible? And if, if that is the case, what can we then do to advance towards this goal? And the were the starting point for a project that we started in the Nordic water sector called Nordic Principles for a Climate Neutral Water Sector. My name is Miriam Feilberg. I represent the Danish Water and Wastewater Association. Um, but in this project, I'm also presenting on behalf of my, my fellow as Nordic Water Associations from Finland, Sweden, Norway, and Denmark. We have made this joint project from our, our four countries uh, in, in the very north of Europe um, to present our efforts and, and to move jointly towards uh, living up to our responsibility related to climate change, but also to, also to live up to other uh, global goals that we are facing uh, and national goals like the European Green Deal and what we are also expecting uh, to come from the revised Urban Wastewater Treatment Directive. We have also started on this in order to have a stronger voice in Europe uh, in terms of presenting our experience. Um, but we can also actually use it to, to strengthen our own domestic policy making. So where we can see some of the other Nordic countries are, are lacking behind a bit, then we can use this to promote what we want to do in common. So these four Nordic countries uh, are, well, the, the size of the countries uh, varies quite a lot, but in terms of inhabitants, they are relatively small countries, uh, all of them. But what we have in common is a relatively high technological level and also uh, water and wastewater systems where inhabitants are connected to centralized systems to a very high degree. We also have very similar figures when we're looking at, as you can see down here, the contribution from the water sector to the national emissions. For both Denmark, Sweden and Norway, this is actually 0.4%. For Finland, it's, it's a bit higher, but it's probably because uh, the figures are a bit older. Um, but we, we started from this, uh, kind of this level and want to look into what we can, what we need to do in order to become climate neutral. We have also very similar targets in the Nordic countries, uh, wanting to lower emissions and move towards eventual climate and energy neutrality when, when differs a bit. Uh, but as you can see for both Denmark and Sweden that are, are most specific. We are also now looking at the operations level that you also touched upon Alberto and I will come back, back to that a little bit later also. But the overall content with this project, the Nordic principles for a climate neutral water sector is not to make a, a common model for climate accounting. But we want to use our experience from the utilities in these four countries to reach a common understanding of climate accounting models, what is needed to do solid climate accountant, and then make some common principles on what, what you need to do. And, and first, what I will present here is kind of the background and status from the North Nordic countries. And then we also made a test of the principles and if they are actually usable in terms of making uh, the climate accounting models, uh, can, we, can we use the results in order to advance towards climate neutrality? So the first step we, we took was to make an overview of the different climate accounting models that we have in place now. What are the parameters that are included in the different models? Finland is developing a model currently, but you can see the parameters here uh, and, and you can get the presentation or look at the report for, to, to have more time to study the details. Um, but we had this overview of the different parameters for waterworks, for sewers, for wastewater treatment plants. 
And you can see some are similar for all of the countries. Uh, they are included in our models and others vary in terms of, of the way we are handling drinking water, wastewater, and so on in, in the different countries. But we have a common set of parameters that are applicable to one or more of the Nordic uh, countries' climate accounting models. The next step is then to look into if we have the data in order to do the accounting and also to, to pay attention to how important the impact is. Um, so we, we went down further in the study, started to look at the, our data availability uh, and the importance of the emissions. The aim is to reach a model where we do not necessarily have all emissions included, but in order to, to advance to the goals that we want to meet and to be a bit more, uh, to make a bit more simple model, to focus on where we have good solid data and of course where there is a strong impact. If there is a strong impact and we have less late data, then of course it's important to start looking at how you can secure better data in this area. We, we want to work towards what we call like an 85% model. It's not because you need to reach exactly 85, but in order to have to, to focus on getting the most important emissions in place and starting to handle that. And then we, we based this, uh, we made this set of common principles. Uh, we can learn a lot from each other. That's also why we are very happy to participate in a webinar like this uh, or present the results at the IWA Congress in Copenhagen. We think it's important that you include all emissions and avoided emissions, and that you're looking at both water supply, transportation, uh, sewage systems, and wastewater treatment plants. We have significant emissions in all of our operations. We think it's, it's a good idea to start by including the operational level, but we can also see, and you mentioned that also, Alberto, uh, again, that emissions from construction and demolition are significant. Uh, studies in Denmark point towards perhaps a factor 10 uh, in terms of emissions from an operational level. And I have, we've written here that it can be included, but probably we should say that it must be included in a later phase. It's important when you want to do the climate accounting that you start measuring the climate emissions and that you can establish some baseline in order to follow the progress of your activities. Um, we, it's, it's also important that you base uh, emission factors on the latest calculations and uh, measurements and scientific results. And as I, I just said, we propose to keep the model and the reporting as simple as possible. Uh, this is what we call the 85% the model. And that you, by doing that, start by selecting contributors where data availability and significance is high. And, and kind of based on these principles and the data we have where we can see uh, what, what matters, uh, then we selected uh, a number of parameters that should be included or that we can recommend to include in climate accounting, uh, still focusing on waterworks, drinking water, on transportation, sewer systems, and in wastewater treatment plants. Um, where, where we have the green marks, uh, we have we have the data in the models already in the countries and in others we are not including that but but it can be uh, it can be a good recommendation to do that the only factor that none are including yet is uh, carbon capture but as this these technologies advance i think we will also get to include that as well so these are the parameters that we propose to include in counting uh, climate accounting models. And then the next question is, is it possible? 
can we actually be, do we have the data? Can we measure and can we track progress? And in order to find out that, we selected information from utilities from four Nordic countries. We have uh, 14 waterworks, 12 sewer systems, and 16 wastewater treatment plants that contributed data to making this overview. Uh, as you can see, there are large variations between utilities and between countries. And I know this is difficult to read, but you can get all the data in, in the report that we have. But just, just to give a, just a few, few more pieces of information on this. I mean, what we learned is that from all the utilities where we collected data, they have data on these different parameters. It varies how much it, it accounts for in the, in the utilities, but they have the data. Uh, and there's also data on avoided emissions, sold energy, and so on. So the, to, to keep it simple, the conclusion is that it is possible to do the uh, recording uh, and measuring of your climate emissions in the water sector. And it's, we are very, con very much convinced that it's also possible to become climate neutral at, not now, I think one is there, but, but some are getting close and for others there's, there's still some way to go, but it will be possible to, to get there at some point. And it's, important information to, to start working towards climate neutrality, um, that it is possible to get there. So just a few take home messages from the work we have been doing, uh, and you can get much more information in this report we have made. Uh, it's important to know what you're doing and start by measuring the emissions. It is possible to do that. And based on that, make a baseline for your activities. Start again by focusing on the most significant contributors. It's also important to set ambitions, ambitious targets. If you want to do that, you also need to have some buy-in from owners, politicians, consumers in your areas. But it's also a good starting point for a discussion on the, the climate impact of the water sector. Based on our uh, study, it's possible to calculate the emissions and uh, to follow the progress. And once, uh, when you have s established the climate accounting model and you're comfortable with doing that in the operational phase, then you can or probably should start looking at the construction phase as well. And, and finally, it's important for water utilities that they need, to, we have a lot of goals in our sector and we need to balance the different goals, energy and climate neutrality, that can be a trade-off here, but also looking into the environmental targets that we have, the costs, the quality. So there are some balances that we need to pay attention to. And finally, uh, greenhouse gas emissions are, of course, not the only area of focus for sustainability in our sector. It's quite important that we avoid carbon tunnel vision, that we are not only looking at carbon emissions, but are also looking at other areas like biodiversity, air pollutants, eutrophication, uh, and so on. I think that is probably going to be a topic also for the fourth webinar in this series, and I think it's a very important discussion to get back to as well. So finally, this is our report. There's a link to the report, uh, and I'm happy to answer questions now, but you can also uh, send questions later when you have had a look at the report, and there are all contact, de contact details in the report as well. Yeah, that was for my part now. And you can see the report. Brenda just sent a link to it. Thank you so much, Miriam, <clears throat> for a very good presentation. Very interesting work. I was also uh, a part of this and I think it was a very, uh, I think we learned a lot. Uh, very interesting to see also how different um, uh, people look at this uh, climate accounting just in, in, in the in different countries where we normally um, normally see each other as, as quite equal um, 
it's it's um, yeah that, that was very um, knowledgeable uh, piece of work. Um, Start with uh, uh, just a few questions from the from the Q and A, Miriam. Um, just a clarification first um, from an anonymous attendee. Thank you for the presentation, Miriam. You mentioned the fact that ten for emissions from infrastructure compared to the operation of the system is that meant on an annualized comparison? Uh, I'm I'm not really sure actually. Uh, uh, no, I think it's well. Actually, I, I, I don't know how they have made that estimate, how, how they're breaking it down. It's, it's one utility in Denmark that has been doing a very thorough study uh, on, on the emissions related to operations compared to the, the construction uh, investment element. Yeah, I think I it's also very out. difficult to make this factor. I mean, it's, uh, I see a lot of different uh, numbers, a lot of different uh, calculations and... and yeah. It's not easy to get. Um, no, I, I don't. Maybe you know, Jakob, how they how they made this system. I don't know exactly about this. No. no. <clears throat> There's a question. On, I think the key message is that there are really significant emissions related to construction phases, and we need to look into that as well. Yeah. Good. Um, There's a question on um, greenhouse gas emissions from sludge. Um, what's the reason to leave these emissions out of the analysis modeling? Uh, it it varies quite a quite a bit uh, where it is and isn't, and, and we have a lot of different uh, ways to do that. Um, yeah. I think it's it's related to the kind of it's for the simplicity of the model actually. Yeah, and I think that's very important. And you also clarified that quite uh, clearly that uh, we really need to also, if we need to, to get all the utilities to work with this, I mean, we need simplicity also. So you need to find that that balance um, so that everybody can, can get started. But I mean, for, for some they are including it and for others they are not having it, it into, but it, but it is difficult to, to work with. Good uh, question on climate models or LCA. Um, have you do you have any experience with that? Um, yeah, I, I know that it, it hasn't been used for this uh, this work, or uh, but you also mentioned this with uh, looking a bit more holistically at at uh, at projects or, or in, in general to, to look more holistically at, at uh, not only uh, calculating CO two and then then you think you are safe. Uh, can you say yeah. a little bit more on, on that? Well, it's it's an element, uh, I don't know, actually in the other Nordic countries, but I think there will be focus on that as well. But I know in the Danish water sector, it's an element that people are beginning to pay more and more attention to, uh, the, the whole life cycle impact of what we are doing. And it will, uh, as I see it, be one of the more important tools in order to look also at... Um, construction and and the building phase and so to include the life cycle assessment perspective um, there is some experience in this not a lot but we will start looking into that now yeah and you can say this this work that you're presenting now me i mean that's also has i mean it's background in in lca thinking i mean it's not a full lca on 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 co2 climate change um but but it it has all these uh, thoughts about it. I mean, what, what what do we need to include? We need to include as much as possible. Um, but 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 for for the the reason in in, in your pro uh, in your project, I mean, we also need this simplicity factor. And then then you don't do full LCAs. Uh, so again, back to this uh, balance. Um, yeah. No, but I, I think in a way LCAs will be the next step when we have the the climate accounting models and we have an overview of that and a, a more solid idea of where we want to go, what activities, and then the LCA will be the next step that we will take. Yeah. We're taking one step at a time. That's what I'm hearing from you. Yeah. Good. Thank you so much, Mia. Uh, we need to move on. Um, 
and I'd like to give the word to uh, Natalia from Bergenland, please. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Natalia Damczyk. I work as a senior engineer in uh, Bergenland. Um, Bergen is the second largest city in, uh, in Norway. Uh, Bergen Van has about um, 260 uh, amazing employ employers. Uh, we have uh, five um, water treatment plants, uh, five uh, sewage water treatment plants with uh, secondary treatment. We have a biogas plant and a really, really lot of pipes and uh, pumps and um, tunnels to pump it uh, through, uh, through the city. Uh, we started looking at um, carbon footprint calculations uh, in uh, 2018. Uh, so we have some experience with, uh, with this one. It, it wasn't easy. Uh, so, um, no, yeah. So um, last year I uh, had the opportunity and the pleasure to talk a little bit about our uh, experience from uh, developing uh, climate footprint calculations. Um, and I thought that uh, it would be nice to revisit uh, this uh, particular presentation and see if it uh, holds up. So today I want to talk about uh, not only how to start and uh, or develop, but only how to maintain your uh, climate footprint calculations uh, in not three, <laughs> but now five um, steps. Uh, and uh, this, uh, I, I hope that it would be, uh, would be um, helpful um, regardless of whether you use uh, or want to make your own carbon footprint calculations of if you use some already uh, developed, uh, developed tools. So it will be a little bit lessons learned uh, from uh, Bergen Van. Um, the the first step is that you need to know your value chain. This is this is something. This is uh, nothing uh, nothing new. We started with operations. Uh, we used um, ISO 14030. This is this uh, LCA uh, approach, but we didn't use it um, to make all the LCA. We just uh, we just used the, the approach and the, the method to start. Um, mapping and making some illustrations of our product system. Uh, it uh, worked really good for uh, operations because in operations uh, we have uh, actually flows from one uh, um, one part of system to the other uh, and uh, this uh, this tool and this approach help uh, help uh, helps really good with um, uh, illustrating it. Um, but when, when we were done with this one, we found out that this approach do not um, work for, um, for, project, for, for project management. So we needed to change the perspective and, um, oh, sorry. Uh, and uh, we uh, looked at uh, Norwegian standard uh, 3720. Uh, this is a standard that is based on uh, European uh, standard on, uh, about sustainability of uh, construction works, uh, and it worked. Uh, so, uh, what is really nice with this uh, this approach is that it is uh, really uh, flexible. You can actually expand on it. You can see the dotted line uh, under uh, the project. Uh, it's uh, phase uh, A6 and A7 that we just added because this is something that we want to have um, a more um, focus on. Uh, so, um, and uh, what is uh, also nice is that uh, you already have this operation uh, phase that you can put inside. Uh, you have also product stage where you can uh, look at uh, indirect uh, emissions from uh, from the products you uh, you buy you purchase, and where you also can uh, ask for uh, EPD or uh, for uh, LCA for uh, those products. So uh, everything ex actually uh, hangs uh, together. So this is something we work with uh, right now. Uh, then you need to organize your emissions. There's a lot of emissions, a lot of uh, measurings um, that uh, a lot of projects uh, that you can hear about. 
so you you need to make some baselines you need to make some system you know, some boundaries for what do you want to look at you can uh, either use uh, this uh, this one uh, standard uh, or you can make the use this one so it, it works for for both uh, it helps you with understanding what you know and what you don't know and if you don't know something that you can uh, pr prioritize to um, to, for example, getting more information about this uh, particular emissions. Uh, it also helps you with making a system that uh, will be easy to maintain later. So if you if you miss some uh, some um, uh, data, you can just fill it out later. Um, this is a new one. This is something we learned. Uh, you need to understand your data. We started uh, with establishing our own uh, energy management system in a power bi and you can see to the left that we uh, we uh, that this is divided in uh, into two um, uh, pieces the the first one uh, is uh, actually based on uh, uh, information data we get from our energy suppliers uh, and it is uh, it is information that is on the more uh, used on a more strategic level uh, when you move uh, further, you can you can see more detailed information, and this is information that comes from our own sensors in uh, in our facilities, where you can go down and see uh, what is energy um, consumption at those uh, different uh, uh, different processes uh, level levels. But what you need to understand is that if you have um, um, yeah, if you have raw data, uh, data that comes from uh, one source, it doesn't uh, have to be in accordance uh, or do not have to respond, uh, correspond to uh, the other database. So what we found out is that um, there is some uh, discrepancy, some mismatch between uh, those two sources and uh, it helps us understand that if you want to use our data for reporting or more uh, strategic uh, planning that we use data from energy supplier, but if we want to uh, plan or um, uh, follow up uh, some uh, measures uh, that we use uh, data from from some source. So you need to know your data and its purpose. Um, the other example is from uh, transport. Um, this is also something we learn. <laughs> you can get uh, data in uh, different um, with different units. Um, sometimes it comes in kilometers, working hours, liters diesel used, and uh, and so on. You can have a different sources to your emission factors. You can use uh, different databases, uh, standards, uh, suppliers have uh, usually their own data or authorities in your country maybe have their own data they want that you will use. Uh, calculations. You need to know what type of calculations is uh, easiest um, to make. Uh, if it's uh, one way or both ways, if you want to look at the single single uh, vehicle or group, or if you want to look at the whole uh, vehicle uh, fleet. And at the end, what is your output in what you need? How do you want to compare uh, all those uh, results? So everything is, uh, the, the most important thing is that you understand what do you have and what do you want to um, achieve, what is your purpose. Um, and uh, it's, it's, it's worth uh, thinking a little bit about, uh, about um, this one. Yes, uh, this is also new. Uh, choose your tool wisely. Uh, in 2018, we started with, uh, with a one, um, Excel file uh, where we had all our calculations. Uh, in 2022, we had five. It was really chaotic, and people who didn't work with um, uh, with uh, Excel file and uh, calculations had no idea of what was uh, happening there. So we needed to do something with it. Uh, we introduced um, Power BI. As I said, now we work with uh, both um, energy management system, but also our uh, climate um, management systems, where we move our climate calculations from Excel to Power BI. 
but um, you you cannot uh, use uh, the one tool for everything. Uh, what we learned is that uh, Excel is really nice in the beginning. It's easy to calculate. Uh, everyone can use it in um, some grade. <laughs> uh, and it's easy to store and exchange the files. But everyone can use it. It means that everyone can also go in and uh, make something with your calculations um, that you have problems with later. Uh, from the other uh, side, um, Power BI. It's really easy to navigate when you make already uh, the report. You can uh, filter and uh, find the data you really need uh, from this particular um, report. It's uh, visual appealing and intuitive to use. Um, you can link up different sources. You can have data clouds. You can have live sensors, just like uh, we did with, uh, with some of, uh, of our uh, sensors. So we have live, live data. Um, but it needs a special competence. It's not as easy and intuitive to, to learn as uh, Excel. It is not for calculations. So some of your calculations um, you will still need to make in Excel or other, uh, other uh, tool, and it costs uh, in addition. Um, so there is always uh, pros and cons, and you need, to, you need to know which tool can you use for which uh, purpose. Yeah. So um, this one is, uh, is still actual. Uh, you cannot do it without help. You need both internal and external stakeholders to help you with um, gathering uh, the data, with um, checking if uh, the data is uh, good to go, if it is something that you can use. You need your uh, IT uh, department and, and so on and so on. So what we did in uh, Bergen, Bergen 1 is to expand on our existing um, management systems for uh, quality and uh, environment um, because we, we had already established a lot of uh, a lot of processes and uh, procedures uh, that we could use to just build on them instead of uh, trying to make something something new so we, we tried to uh, to map a little bit um, how do we want to work with uh, all those aspects? We have a little bit about energy management, uh, the, the ISO standard that we, we use uh, that helps us with um, putting everything uh, together. We have a little process for carbon footprint with, with those two um, ISO standards or standards that uh, I, I mentioned uh, earlier. And the administration uh, level helps with um, with communication, uh, looks at uh, all the all the systems and standards and other uh, tools that uh, you can use, like SQL or Bream, and um, see if it is something that we can use or uh, we can inspire us <laughs> with. And then we have the executive uh, strategic level where all the inputs from all those uh, little uh, processes goes uh, to uh, climate and energy coordination group. And there we have people from uh, the whole organization that uh, both work internal and uh, external with uh, stakeho stakeholders. But we, um, we also uh, make reports uh, that goes uh, further to our uh, management level uh, to help them with understanding uh, the energy and the climate situation uh, we are in. So this is also something uh, something new we try to put. We try to make the, the whole new process for how do we work with uh, climate, energy, and environmental aspects in our projects. Uh, the the green, uh, green part of the process is the detailing phase, and this is where we want to uh, use this uh, this standard to build on it and make some uh, manual for uh, how do we um, how do we calculate our carbon footprint calculations that we can use both internal and external. Uh, some uh, lessons learned. Um, start with operations and then move uh, further into other depart departments. Um, this is something that uh, was already said uh, before. 
Um, data obtained from different sources will be difficult to compare uh, without some uh, generalization. This is also something that already uh, been said. Um, you need to simplify things sometimes. Remember the purpose of your calculations. Um, choose your fight. You can do everything at once. And the last one, use already existing systems uh, just to expand on them and not do something, something new. Thank you very much. Thank you, Natalia, <clears throat> for this very excellent uh, presentation. Um, and I really enjoyed your, your new steps, uh, especially step three, uh, understanding uh, the data and the calculations. I think that's uh, very important <clears throat> that we don't just um, use any emission factor out there and then we think we, we are more knowledgeable. Uh, we really need to, to understand what we're doing state the basis and then we can work on from there to get what we really need is the, the, the reduction of, uh, of emissions. Um, very good, um, very good uh, Natalia. Um, I would like to uh, to ask you one question because it's, uh, it's very thorough work that you've done, um, quite detailed, um, um, also time consuming, I would guess. Right. <laughs> you have some recommendations to, to other utilities because I'm sure that not all utilities have the <clears throat> sorry, the, the resources and time to, to do this five step model. Um, do you have any like general recommendations how to 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 get started? How to I mean if, if you <clears throat> if you're not there yet, how do how do you start working on this? I think that you, you can actually use this uh, this model, but you look at, uh, you, you choose two or three um, emissions, the, the, the biggest sources to your to your emissions. So you, you start with what you have. You can look at, for example, energy consumption. You can look at your chemicals. You can look at your uh, transport. Just, just see what you already have or what is uh, not that uh, hard to obtain. And uh, start with this. The, the most important thing is to start and build on it. It's a process. It, it takes time. Uh, this is, I, I don't think it is something that you can just uh, sit down and, and you do. You need to understand how your organization works. You need to talk with um, different departments. Uh, and uh, understanding is, is the most uh, important uh, thing. And not necessarily try to uh, copy or um, do the same as the others. You need to understand why do you want to do it. If you, if you see that um, energy is the biggest issue, start with energy. Look at, uh, look at your uh, emissions, uh, try to see where do they come from. See at your uh, factors, try to calculate it and try to make some measures to, to reduce and just look, look how, it, uh, how it goes. Good. Yeah, and I agree. I mean, your your five step procedure can, I mean, it can be used in many different uh, levels. Uh, I guess um, you don't have to to start with a very detailed level. You maybe just get started <laughs> and and get yeah. uh, get the baseline. Yeah. <clears throat> Good, uh, Natalia. Um, do you have to have? Um, does different data quality and frequency mean that you have to have multiple accounting systems depending on the purpose? Um, I mean, for maybe you need online data to actually minimize, reduce the emissions, and then you have to have some other data, static data, to uh, do some reporting for uh, government or, I mean, how, how, what do you think? Yes, it's a little bit like this, uh, what I, what I uh, showed with, with the energy. We have, uh, actually in our report, we have two sources to data. This is two separate um, databases. Um, and uh, we, we are lucky that we have it. Uh, but I think that uh, if you, in the beginning, you start with uh, the reporting one, I think, because this is something that goes uh, to authorities. This, this is something that uh, uh, gives you some strategical uh, understanding. Uh, and then if you have already some sensors, you can, you can try to, uh, to get data 
from there. If you do not have, then it can be a good opportunity to do it at once, um, install some and uh, connect it uh, to the uh, to, to your report. Uh, but um, Power, Power BI and uh, database management, it is, uh, it is not easy. <laughs> so I think that the, the easiest part is to start with Excel, understanding what do you have, and then you can move it. But I wouldn't, um, I wouldn't, oh, um, now I forget the, the word. But do, do not start with Power BI in the beginning. I do not recommend it. Yes, it was, uh, yeah. start easy, really easy, and then try to move to a more detailed view. Build from yeah. the top level down, not, not from the uh, detail level up. Yeah, I think that's also what we, we heard from, from Miriam. I mean, maybe also start with the operational phase, then you can add more when you understand that, mm -hmm. then you can add the, the construction phase, and then when you're there, you can start maybe uh, doing life cycle assessments. I mean, do, do one step at a time um, in in your own uh, pace. Uh, yeah. Yes, and I think I think that if you if you start with something that you know, it wouldn't be that uh, discouraging when you just hop into into uh, the ocean of uh, strange <laughs> strange factors and uh, and data. You you have no. Uh, you don't understand. So start what you uh, what you know. Yeah. Good. We will be uh, moving into the the general uh, Q and A session, um, and I will ask some some questions to the panelists, and also taking in questions from the the Q and A. So you can you can still post questions there in the Q and A uh, session. Um, I would like to ask the uh, panelists first. Uh, just uh, one, two minutes uh, from each of you. Um, can you say what what do you think is the the the, the biggest um, source of emission where we can actually do something? I mean, what, what, the low hanging fruits. You can say what 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 can we do already now where we really uh, which can have an impact? Uh, maybe also you can say something about risks related to the to greenhouse gas accounting. Um, Alberto, if you can uh, go first. Are you there, Alberto? No, doesn't seem that way. We'll just uh, bring the same question to Natalia. Are you there, Natalia? Um, yeah. Yes, um, I think that uh, when I look at Norway, I think that energy is uh, is the, um, the the biggest source of uh, energy that we actually can do something with, and this is uh, because um, uh, energy in Norway was actually cheap <laughs> before, uh, and uh, and there is uh, a lot of a uh, lot of possibilities uh, for optimizing processes to choosing uh, other ways of doing the same but uh, minimalizing uh, energy consumption and uh, the, the other other thing is that uh, you can look at, um, at the possibilities to um, produce energy this is also something that uh, that is a good topic to to look at um, so I, I think that this, this is something that we focus on uh, this uh, at this um, um, at this uh, point. Um, yeah. Uh, what was the second question? Sorry. <laughs> you're mute. Only mute. You're muted. Sorry. Any any risks in relation to this? I mean, uh, now we're talking about this that we should just uh, jump <laughs> jump into it, and start. Uh, no. Actually, you start measuring. Are there any risks related to this way of doing it? Uh, <clears throat> of course, I, I think that uh, uh, when when you talk about uh, changing a process, it's all, all, always a risk, especially when you talk about um, when you think about um, biological processes. Uh, it's always a risk when you when you change something. Uh, it can uh, have consequences. So you do not. Uh, you, you always have to. Uh, remember why are we 
uh, where do where do we have those plants? Uh, so this is the main purpose the, that we can uh, reduce uh, energy consumption is just uh, is just like like a second uh, uh, second um, thing uh, I, I think so as as long as you can uh, have the quality the same quality of your uh, processes and treatment and you can uh, actually uh, deliver the same quality of your services it's okay but if there is some risk that uh, the quality will be uh, will uh, worsen then i think this is this is something that should be taken into into account thank you natalia um i'll throw the question to alberto again it seems like he was just uh, off are you on again alberto oh yeah sorry sorry i had a hiccup yeah yeah did you hear the question uh, can you make it back? Uh, Big, biggest uh, biggest contributions to, to CO2 emissions uh, that we can actually do something about. Yeah. Uh, maybe also something on, on, on risks of, of uh, uh, when doing uh, greenhouse gas uh, accounting. Yeah, uh, I think there is a point that we we are always uh, reminded also by, by Vanessa when <laughs> addressing this uh, this topic. Uh, the, the primary goal is to secure uh, a, a processes that deliver a good treatment of wastewater. So, uh, for instance, if, uh, if you produce uh, renewable energy at the expense of uh, denitrification, for instance, because you use less than efficiently your uh, uh, carbon, uh, your organic carbon, uh, then uh, this can be a problem. So in general, I agree that uh, um, going uh, energy neutral uh, in the sense of uh, using uh, uh, energies that you can possibly produce on site or any way offset your energy consumption uh, with renewable energies and decarbonizing energy is uh, uh, no regret option anyway. Uh, for the rest, uh, certainly having uh, good uh, denitrification is a, is a good way to go, uh, but, uh, but also then uh, biogas management is another aspect, so the, the two things together should uh, combine with uh, electricity management. In general, I think uh, the um, proposed uh, revision of the Urban Wastewater Treatment Directive includes an objective of energy neutrality, which is uh, a stimulus uh, towards uh, climate neutrality, but at the same time uh, raises a bit the ambition on uh, nitrogen removal, which is also kind of a, a constraint in order not to go uh, in the, what was uh, dubbed uh, nicely the carbon uh, tunnel vision. Uh, so not considering only carbon per se, but also in the context of an efficient uh, wastewater treatment process. Thank you so much, Alberto. Uh, Miriam, are you also there? Maybe Miriam also having some problems here. Um, yeah, I would also like to um, to go back into the uh, some of the questions. Uh, there was a question uh, question from from uh, Miguel. Um, he writes, uh, we've seen a number of cases where increased pretreatment for anaerobic digestion um, leads to much higher nitrous oxide emissions. Will the Urban Wastewater Directive draft not just increase the nitrous oxide emissions with the one-sided focus of the energy production for CO2 reduction? Um, and I think this is very interesting. It's also, I mean, um, there are also other um, examples of some of these emissions uh, going in opposite directions i mean also when you uh, if we need to do the advanced treatment i mean there we we are getting much more um, co2 emissions uh, based on that so so different uh, purposes um, that goes in, in in quite different ways um, do any of you have any thoughts on that uh, maybe alberto um, If you could uh, give some thoughts on that. Uh, yeah, I think the general point is that uh, each case uh, is, uh, is a bit different. Uh, and uh, so an audit or anyway an assessment at, uh, at the plant level is probably uh, necessary as a starting point. Anyway, as a general uh, consideration, I think that having an energy neutrality um, vision on the one side 
and a high ambition on uh, uh, water quality, so the quality of treated effluents uh, on the other side uh, are uh, potentially a good combination to uh, contain the possible drifts uh, towards a one-sided view of the problems that brings uh, uh, back problems on other sides, like uh, for instance if the objective is to have uh, maximized uh, uh, yeah, methane production, but is then produce more N2O uh, from the process, uh, that could be, uh, of course, a problem. Uh, um, I, I think we are not yet uh, at the point of addressing this granularity of the problems, and, uh, and probably we need more, uh, more analysis. But uh, at the same time, I think the direction is that uh, we should start uh, being conscious of the greenhouse gas emissions balance uh, of, uh, of the process as a whole and the energy balance that is related to that. Thank you, uh, Adato. Um, <clears throat> I'd like to, to also hear the, the panelists uh, on uh, if, you, if you could mention the, the, the most important thing, uh, like policy-wise, um, that, that should be implemented um, now in the next, uh, the, the, the coming years, in order for, for really make a difference uh, in, in, in decreasing the CO2 uh, load from, from, uh, from the water sector. Natalia? Do you have a perspective on that? Um, well, uh, also taking into from, account the, the question from Mikkel before that we really need to think that, I mean, what is it that we want? I mean, uh, we want both energy and, and climate neutrality maybe, but um, maybe it does not work uh, together. Maybe we, we, we need to, to um, have emphasis on, on one thing. And that's what Miguel is writing, that he thinks there's maybe a little bit too much emphasis on the energy side in the, in the, um, in the draft for the Urban Wastewater Directive. Um, yeah. Sorry, I took your word. No, no, it's, it's okay. I try to, uh, try to uh, wrap my head uh, head about um, uh, head around it. Um, I'm not sure if I understand the, the question, but um, uh, if I could uh, uh, point at something that would be helpful, uh, like um, help from authorities in uh, in Norway in our uh, in like uh, water and. Uh, sewage uh, part. I, I think that um, I don't know. I, I was thinking about uh, about um, um, uh, f f financial help to carbon removal because this is this is something on the uh, like. Um, mm more uh, wider level and this is something that uh, we we have been talking about lately that if you if you really it's you cannot just reduce it it will not help and this is uh, of course you can reduce some of the energy but you cannot uh, get rid of all emissions from the energy so of course there is some some limits this is uh, low hanging fruits and you shouldn't maybe use more time more energy or resources for reducing even more so but you need to do something else so uh, so um, carbon removal to try to look at uh, possibilities uh, maybe uh, try some uh, give some financial help um, um, try to make some more <laughs> more research <laughs> more possibilities on on this one i think it would be uh, it would be really great yeah, but, but do we do we need help. some more legislation is it wanted by the by the utilities also to to kind of uh, make a guideline um, what we see in denmark is that that a lot of the utilities are actually doing something and they have been doing something for quite some years for especially on the measurements on nitrous oxide um, without having any financial benefit, uh, but maybe if you put in a CO2 tax or something, it would be it, it would uh, enhance uh, or increase the 
the pace of the implementation of of, um, uh, of technologies and and um, yeah for, for CO2 reductions. But, but I, are you ready in the utility? You're from the, the utility, Natalia. Uh, do you want more legislation? <sighs> I, I I will <laughs> yes and no. It's a, it's it's a hard question because it's it's always nice to have some uh, rules and uh, regulations, but the problem is that. Um, yeah, the, the problem is that sometimes you can have rules and regulations that do not suit you and they are more problematic. Mm. So uh, I would say yes to something that is clever and actually will, will help, but sometimes it's better without, without it because not all, it's, it's not always like those who make those, those rules understand uh, what, where the problem is and how to, what to do with it. So of course it would be nice uh, with some help but at the same time, um, this help can uh, can be problematic if it's not uh, a wise help. Yeah, I have, I have, I understand what you're saying. I have the same feeling that that uh, the entire sector needs some 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 not necessarily legislation, but we we need some guidance and maybe yes. some some common uh, some common grounds, common tools, common emission factors. So we, we kind of speak the same language. And that was also actually a part of also what Miriam uh, presented today, that that was the, kind of the first part of that project with the different um, water and wastewater associations in the, in the Nordic to speak together and, and, and try to uh, see if they were actually um, uh, speaking the same language. That's the, the very first, uh, first part of that. Um, did you have a say on this? Uh, yeah, um, I think on uh, whether we need more legislation or uh, more policies or more explicit policies, etc. Yeah, I think it's uh, it's always a problematic question because in general, I, I'm not sure that more legislation uh, necessarily helps in, in this respect. Uh, in the revision of the Urban Wastewater Treatment Directive, uh, there was an intention also to address uh, the greenhouse gas emissions uh, side of the problem, but uh, eventually there was a serious um, uh, question on the uh, mandate of this directive uh, in the context of the broader climate action of the European Union. So. Uh, so whether this was the right place to put constraints or uh, specific objectives, uh, whether the sector of urban wastewater treatment uh, was uh, the right place to start necessarily in every country and so on. So I think we have already a number of uh, tools, of policy tools and constraints and pieces of legislation that force us to take one direction. And, uh, and we should harness uh, the tools that we have in order to make the best of them and achieve an objective of water quality on the one side and an objective of uh, energy efficiency, etc., energy um, self-sufficiency, and uh, at the same time having in mind this long-term objective of the, uh, of the carbon uh, efficiency as well. So if we don't, uh, if we're not able to reduce everything to zero, at least we are efficient and then we leave uh, to less efficient processes the uh, the the mandate to to implement more cost effective measures sometimes good. very good points uh, Alberto and that's going to be the the last words for today's uh, webinar uh, thank you all in the panelists and also all the attendees for all the the questions um, I just have a few things uh, here uh, at the very end just putting this slides for for fifteen seconds. Please remember the three more webinars in this webinar series. Um, yeah, and also uh, there are two upcoming uh, IWA webinars and events that I would like to uh, show you here. Uh, the Young Water Professionals Get Together uh, and also the webinar called uh, Waterproof. And you can read more um, and also, uh, um, yeah, uh, for the attendance, you can you can click the link uh, in the bottom of this page. Um, and the very large uh, last slides, um, yeah, join the network of water professionals. Um, there's a discount code here that you can uh, use for new membership. 
uh, and also here you can see the link. Um, and then I would just like to, to wrap up and uh, again, thank you all um, uh, for attending and I hope to see you again uh, at the next webinar in, uh, in June. Thank you so much. See you.